Seven Signs of Fishing to Watch Out For. Hi everyone, Leo Notenboom here for AskLeo.com. Ask Leo is brought to you free in part due to the support of its patrons. Thank you, patrons. If you'd like to become one and help Ask Leo continue to do what I do and get access to patron exclusive content, visit AskLeo.com slash patron for more information. So a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine out of the blue got this message. You'll see it on your screen. I've got a lot of private information blurred out. That's intentional, of course. But the question she had for me was, is this legit? The classic case of you're getting a piece of email and it looks just convincing enough to maybe, maybe be legitimate. On the other hand, it could be scam. It could be a phishing attempt. Let's take a look at some of the signs in this message that show what it really is and why she was right to raise the alarm. The seven signs of phishing that I'm going to talk about in this video include this message was received out of the blue with no additional context. I want to be clear, the person that this message looks to be from is someone that my friend had corresponded with several months ago. This message just showed up as being from that person. No prior conversation, no prior information. And as you'll note in the message itself, there's no explanation, nothing. There is no context whatsoever. That's a sign. As I said, the message contained no additional information anywhere about why this document had been sent. That's a sign what I call bogus or misleading file names. If you take a look at the file name that's shown here in the middle of this, you've been granted access information. It's S, pound sign, some numbers, some more numbers, a slash, a bunch of, it's meaningless. It's completely meaningless. Generally, real documents will have real file names. People don't store things as random numbers. They actually store them as real file names that have some kind of indication about what's inside. Incomplete branding. This is an interesting one. You'll note that there's a, uh, a, an icon that kind of looks like it's an Excel document. And in fact, there's a Microsoft logo down here. But in fact, that's it. There's nothing that says that this is on OneDrive. If it had been shared using a Microsoft property, then it would have said OneDrive somewhere on the email. All it says is Microsoft, and it kind of infers this Excel spreadsheet, but it is not OneDrive. The two line that you can't see here because I've obscured it, this message was actually sent from someone to themselves. That's a clue. It's not always a clue. It is something that people can do legitimately to basically hide all of the recipients on the BCC line. It's one way to send an email. You send it to yourself and then you just BCC all the recipients so that they don't A, know who else got the message, but more importantly, they don't get access to everybody else's email address. And yet, in conjunction with the other clues we're seeing here, the fact that this message was not sent to my friend, that she was BCC'd, that's a clue. This next one is kind of surprising. It looks like this is a legitimate-ish email. We've all seen emails that kind of sort of look like this. They have some text, they have an icon to a document, they've got a button to open the document, they've got a logo, a privacy statement, all that good stuff. Except if you look carefully, there's no text here at all. This is in fact one image. If you select it just by dragging your mouse over it, you'll see that rather than selecting text, we're selecting an entire image. That's a huge sign. What that means is that whatever you click on here, be it the document to download it, the button that says open the document, or even if you try and go to the privacy statement, then that will open the single link that this entire email is attempting to get you to go to. And by the way, 
that link is bogus. Let's hover over this and you'll see now down in the lower left hand corner, there's this obscure domain, an obscure number dot grape drop dot net. Now, it's possible that grapedrop.net is totally legitimate. I really don't know. But the fact that there's this weird domain that has nothing to do with anything in the document or has nothing to do with anything that my friend would know about is a huge sign that, you know what? This is a phishing attempt. Now, there are more clues you could look for. Absolutely. One of the first things that I did when I saw this message, when this person sent it to me, is I went over to show original. Now, the original has a lot of information and a lot of header information, a lot of other stuff that honestly, you're not expected to know about. There's a reason that you don't normally see it. But even to me, who kind of sort of understands what's going on in those headers, it wasn't necessarily clear that there was something going on here. There are tools that you can use, online tools, and one of them I point in the um, article that this video is based on called Email Header and Analyzer from MX Toolbox. You can then copy and paste the headers from the email that we just had and into a form on their site, and they will tell you what they can tell about the email. One of the important things is something called DMARC or SPF and DKIM. In this case, this particular email failed both SPF, which basically says this was sent by a server that is allowed to send email on behalf of the person sending the email, which it wasn't, or SDKIM, which says this email was legitimately sent by that particular domain, which it wasn't. Um, those, again, are more clues that you can find out to determine whether or not an email you've received is, in fact, legitimate. Now, the question, of course, is why didn't a spam filter catch it? Well, lots of reasons. It's possible that it looked good enough. Many of the clues that I've talked about so far are subjective. They are just clues. They are not absolute rules. Computers love rules. They don't like so much are <laughs> vague things, subjective things. Typically what happens with a spam filter is it will take a look at some of those clues and each of those clues will be given some amount of weight as to whether or not they all add up to something that says, yep, this email probably should be considered spam. Unfortunately, also many of the clues like using BCC or even the SPF and DKIM failures, they're actually common in legitimate mails. They shouldn't be. I get that, but they can be. And that's part of what makes spam filtering so incredibly difficult. It has to be very, very clear and very, very subtle. Typically, a spam filter will err on the side of not marking something as spam and letting you make the decision as opposed to a false positive, which then throws the uh, you know, potentially legitimate email into your spam folder. So spam filters work and work well. This happens to be a Gmail account and Gmail spam filters are still, in my opinion, the best. But they're not perfect. And this is a great example of how a lot of these objective clues can all add up to Gmail kind of saying, well, could be legit. We'll send it on to the inbox and let the user make the decision. Now, the question, of course, that I get a lot is what happens if I had clicked on this email? What happens if my friend had clicked on this email expecting to download a document? It's unclear. I don't know. I have not clicked on it and I'm not going to. What probably happens is something like this. Like I said, the email looks relatively legitimate. They the email promises something, right? The goal of phishing, the goal of spam is to get you to interact with the email, to click on the link or to open the attachment. So they want to dangle something in front of you that captures your interest and gets you to interact with that email. When you click on that link, there is a good chance it will probably take you to something that looks like a Microsoft account login page. Like I said, this kind of is trying to look like a Microsoft account shared document. Theoretically, it should be OneDrive. 
but of course it's not. We know that now. But in theory, it's trying to look kind of Microsoft-ish. So what they'll probably take you to is something that looks like a Microsoft login page, perhaps on that bogus domain, perhaps on a different page that that domain then automatically redirects you to. On that page, if you don't realize that it's not a real Microsoft login page, you enter your account information. As soon as you hit login or sign in, you've just given your account ID and password to a hacker. That login will appear to fail. How it appears to fail, it's unclear. They may even get you to do it more than once. The bottom line is that you'll have typed in your username and password to a site that is not a Microsoft site. The hackers can then collect your login ID and your password and then go hack your account. They can log in as you, change your password, grab your data, hold it hostage, act as you, send spam as you, grab your other accounts, whatever it is they feel like doing once they've got access to this account. That's why it's so incredibly important to think before you click. Remember, the spammer's goal is to get you to interact with that email. That's either clicking a link in the email, as this email was trying to do, or getting you to open an attachment included with that email. Think before you click. There are times when it's perfectly legitimate to click on a link because it is something you're expecting and from someone you know and from someone you've been having a conversation with. There are times when it's perfectly legitimate to open an attachment for those same reasons. But there are many times where it is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Spam filters aside, Ultimately, it's your responsibility to be able to tell the difference. I hope this helps you at least think of a few of the things to look at when you're evaluating a piece of email and trying to make the determination of whether or not it's safe to click or open that attachment. For related links, for a few more examples, for comments, updates, and more, visit askleo.com slash 136589. I'm Leo Notenboom. This is AskLeo.com. Thanks for watching.